Thank you. Um, so, it's just after lunch on a Sunday afternoon. I'm not going to be one of those uh, speakers who ask you to get up and move around, but instead I am going to make you do a little bit of work and ask you a very simple question. And when I, when I use uh, project, I'm, this can mean product, project, library, whatever. We're just going to use a generic word, so um, a, group, a bit of code, a collection of code, basically. But what's one of the first things that you will look at when you find a new project that you're interested in? Anybody? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a trick question, I know. And even those of you who didn't answer, I would guess it's at least in the top three, the things you look for. Documentation of some form or another to understand what something is, what it can do for you, and how to use it, how to get started. So setting a little bit of context about why is documentation important um, and what is good documentation. Firstly, I've got a quote, unfortunately, from the creator of Perl, nothing to do with Python. And my, uh, my, um, uh, my admittance is that I am not a Python programmer <laughs> at all. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a documentation person, of course. But this is a quote from the creator of Perl that documentation is complete when you, someone can use your project without having to look at its code. And I would grant that there are quite a lot of times when you maybe just want to look at the code because you just want to. But I'm also probably assuming there's a lot of times where you read something, didn't understand it, and had to look at the code to understand it, whether you wanted to or not. It's not uncommon. So we all know that having something that's understandable is important. But really, most of the time, it feels like this. This is a quote I had from um, someone who works at the Wikimedia Foundation, who I just met at a conference, and I thought it was a great quote. I wanted to include it. That Documentation is like housework. It's something we all know we should do, but we don't really want to. We'd rather be doing something else, unless you're sort of a crazy person like me who actually likes doing documentation and doesn't like coding so much. <laughs> so most of the time, it's something you feel like you should do, but you don't really want to. You'd rather be doing something else. So this presentation is basically um, a little bit of a run through through my quick tips on how to make documentation better without too much effort and some ideas and things to try. And a little bit of an introduction also to kind of the technical writer's tool chain. We, we are sort of halfway to programmers, so we have our own sorts of likes and dislikes and frameworks and tools that we argue about which one is better than the other as well. So we'll cover a little bit of that too. So first, I'm going to start with my kind of three W's. You have to have a, a sort of something to remember. So this is something I've made up to get people thinking in the first place. And this is the who are you writing for? What are they trying to achieve? And then why are you writing this? And actually, in some respects, especially with commercial projects or projects that are bigger than just a library you decide to make in a kind of a weekend, it's probably something you've thought about already, actually. Um, it's a business case. It's a use case. Um, and maybe if you're part of a company, you've had UX people, product designers, etc., already think about some of these questions. And actually, you can carry them through to the documentation, too. Why? Oh, sorry, I'll start with the who. Who are you actually writing this for? Is it for someone who has... And actually, these questions have different answers depending where you are in the documentation. So for example, a getting started guide, you can probably assume that someone doesn't really know much about the project yet. So that's a different sort of audience than someone who is then looking at reference documentation, API documentation, where maybe they understand a bit more and want to know a bit more detail. So there's different who's at each stage. What are they trying to achieve? Again, this will vary depending on the project and how complex it is and what you can do with it. Projects that are very flexible, obviously, have lots of different use cases. A project that has a very particular use case has less use cases, so you can probably have a better guess about what they're trying to achieve. And then the final one, why are you writing this? Um, I suppose this is because sometimes I've actually found in a lot of companies I've worked at, it's not actually a lack of documentation that's a problem. It was a lack of clear documentation. I've worked at lots of companies where the first thing I've done is get rid of half their documentation. 
because it's been added to time over time by different people and you've got a very hard to understand, hard to navigate mess. So actually before writing anything, do you need to? What's its purpose? Is it actually needed? Or are you just doing it because you feel like you should? So, and in a couple of places in this presentation, I would actually bring up this concept of sometimes less is more, actually. So diving down into these with a bit more detail, my first statement is assume nothing. Um, there is a, a slightly rude, offensive phrase that I won't mention, that assumption is the mother of all something-ups, and it's true. And we are actually very guilty of this in the technical world as well. We assume that everything that we make and do is standard or normal, and that surely everyone else does it. And surely that this tool chain that we use, surely everyone else uses that, they just got it. I don't need to tell them they need to install X, Y, and Z. They should have it. Surely they've got it. I've got it. He's got it. Why haven't they got it? So my first question would be, assume nothing. Don't expect that everyone does have the tool chain that you expect. And equally, don't necessarily assume that your way of working and your way of uh, coding or creating a project is um, going to be understood by everybody. And this especially applies these days where a lot of programmers don't always come from university backgrounds or formal education and have learned as they go um, and may not have a lot of context behind things like design patterns and more conceptual programming that maybe you've had if you've been educated in a university. So this may yet start to sound like a lot of work, but actually uh, not only does it start to make it easier to then explain what you want to explain, but it also starts to breaking down your own assumptions is actually a good way of understanding um, things as a whole anyway, and also just starting to pick apart something you've worked on. My second uh, statement would be refine your concepts, maybe. And this would be, I would say, start by writing a simple explanation about what the project does. And I think actually here we can learn something maybe from the kind of startup world of like elevator pitches. I personally feel, personally, and this might be a controversial statement, that anything, no matter how complicated, can be broken down into a simple explanation. Okay, it's a simple explanation. It's just a brief summary of what something does, but it gives people an idea of, is this for me? Is this useful to me? And if so, they'll look further to find out more information. And granted, there are some people who are very good at creating complex code, and there are some people who are very good at explaining it or selling it to people. If you're not one of those people, then find someone who is. There's an increasing amount of technical writers, technical marketing people who will help you just refine that concept and make it, just nail down that use case about very briefly explaining what it is you're trying to do. And yeah, especially in academic circles, you often find that people say, no, 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 I need two hours to explain it. Two hours is the minimum amount of time I can have to explain this. Like, I actually think you could just come up with a 30 second summary of what it is and then you can go into more detail if people are interested. So, second controversial statement is API docs are not always enough. Um, I say this because API docs are kind of an explanation of the tools. They're the explanations of the different bits and pieces of the project and what they do. So this endpoint does this and returns this, this endpoint does this and returns this, but they don't necessarily explain how people can fit them together to do something. So if you have API docs, great, fantastic. But I would also suggest you have at least one sort of getting started guide to make people understand how they can assemble these API endpoints to something usable and useful. Um, this actually does vary per language. It's quite interesting, there's been some analysis I think a lot of this report, and I'll refer to it again soon as well, come, came from the University of Potsdam, just outside of Berlin. And um, they did some research of how different language programmers read documentation. And for example, Java developers, possibly because they tend to have been around longer, um, and it's a much more established language, 
tend to go straight into API docs and that's all they need to know because the paradigms and the ways they work are kind of fairly set in stone and they can get what they need from that. Whereas for example, JavaScript developers, a newer language, a less established language, the developers tend to go more for getting started guides. Python, I'm not sure, it's probably somewhere in the middle. And in fact, uh, even though I'm not a Python developer, I should say at this point that the Python community and the Python tooling is probably some of the best. And I'm not saying that just because I'm here, I say that in all my other talks too. So it's a good community for documentation anyway. So, <laughs> so it's already got a very strong um, plus point. Secondly is it's not a manual. Um, another interesting uh, outcome from this survey was that there are a few cultures mostly Asian cultures who do actually read uh, instructions from start to finish and then go and do something. But most uh, of the world doesn't actually. We tend to look for something we want, we jump away, do something else, come back for what we want, jump back and forth, and we don't follow things in a linear way. So this kind of says that you can't assume people are going to write, read things in a certain order. So, and this is especially um, problematic now in that a lot of people, despite what you may add to your documentation in your website, they don't search it. They often find the results through a search engine. So you've no idea how people have even ended up on a page anyway. So if they needed to do three steps before the step of the page they're on to get to that point, then there needs to be a clear way that people can do that. This can be a side menu, or just a kind of summary of steps at the top of a document. It largely depends, but basically the, the take home point here, here is you cannot assume that people, again, you can't assume anything. Basically, you cannot assume that people have read what they need to know already. Um, if you have a product, maybe a hardware product, for example, that people have to do things in a certain order or it's not going to work, then you can find ways to onboard them properly. And this is almost a little bit more of a product decision from sort of product designers too, about that way of getting people the right steps they need to to get started. But with, a, with software, mostly it's kind of great if they would do things in a certain order, but it's not completely essential. But if they need to authenticate or something like that, make sure there's easy ways of people being able to get back to the steps they need to do. One of the um, next interesting steps is interactivity. We are now mostly writing documentation. We're not writing print manuals really these days. Even ebooks, you can theoretically add some sort of non-text. And especially for less experienced programmers or younger programmers, I've actually found that adding interactivity to documentation helps a lot. It actually really, really helps. We found a lot better understanding, a, a lot better um, interaction with the documentation and a lot less kind of questions asked about those problems. So documentation in this case isn't just text. So you can do a number of different things. I'm going to show you some examples. These can be embedded examples or interactive examples, um, API browsers that you can experiment with, or even if uh, you haven't got the time or the technical uh, resources to make something like that, videos or animated GIFs are also very useful. And videos especially are very popular with, again, beginner or younger developers. Um, more experienced ones tend to find them frustrating because you just want to browse through something to find what you need. And there are actually players that can support that. But with um, less experienced developers, videos are really, really effective. So here's an example of when I was working for a, a database startup and we had like a fake JavaScript console here where you can enter a query change it if you like, hit enter, and you, it's all fake, of course, but it looks like a real console and people can actually try the syntax and see what happens with the response. This took a little bit more work, but it was quite effective, especially because one of the plus points with this uh, project was its flexibility and speed. So it was a way of showing how quickly the results were processed too, even though it was sort of over the web. Um, then in the uh, JavaScript world, you have sort of wonderful things like JS Fiddle, which is an embedded service, but you can actually jump into the code and play around with parameters and watch results change live-ish. There we go. 
and just get an idea of um, how changes affect output. And I'm pretty sure someone is talking or has talked a little bit about the Jupyter Notebooks, which I think is a similar sort of concept in the Python world. Um, and finally, and interestingly, there's actually one of the Apiary developers here. <laughs> this is actually an example from Apiary. Um, so this is an API console they have where you can, I don't know if it's very clear, but you can put in the parameters for the endpoint, issue the query, and again, get results. Um, I don't know if it's very clear, but I think you get the idea. You've possibly seen it before. And these are all very, very helpful. Picking the right examples is a challenge in itself. But, um, and also if you're going to do certain ones of these, like especially the first one, you have to think about test environments and things like that, especially with the database. You have to make sure people can't drop the database and things like that. But um, yeah, but if you could get this right, it's a very effective uh, method. Okay, let's jump onto language. What are my language tips? As you can probably tell, I'm a native English speaker. This gives me uh, a lot of advantage in this uh, world, but I'm going to give you a few tips. Um, and I'm hoping that some of them are transferable to other languages. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Um, so my first one is involve the reader. This is um, an interesting one. I was actually skeptical about this myself to begin with. And then through sort of experimentation and trying it myself, I realized not only did people actually prefer the writing in the long run, but actually it made writing it easier too. So whilst we tend to think that writing with a kind of more user-focused user approach can wander into being um, patronizing sometimes, if you get it right, it can be a very effective way of making people feel like they're going on a journey with you, which I know we're not writing fiction, but you can actually um, make something interesting to read. So here's an example. Function takes parameter x and returns value y. This, it makes sense, it's clear. Okay, it doesn't say very much, it's just an example, but you get it. What about this instead? You can use function to return the value of y based on x. Okay, it's not a massive difference, but it adds, it involves the reader a little bit. It is kind of telling them that they can accomplish something. And whilst this is a very simple example, kind of in the, in the long run of using this in more complex things, it can actually help people um, feel like they're understanding something better than just the kind of more dry language. Now, there's more that we could do to improve this, of course, uh, and it gets more complicated, the more complicated the example. But try doing things like this. Um, and another little tip I'll throw in is that try to be consistent. Whether you want to say you or we, as in you're taking them on a journey, be consistent. Whatever one you choose is up to you, but don't mix them. Just pick you or we and then stick with that. So just getting into linguistics, this is an example of what is called passive versus active. And I don't know if other languages have this, but it's kind of a classic um, Critic's well comment in, in English, especially in British English. British English tends to have this uh, being overly passive. And I'm going to show you an example, and it'll sort of make a bit of sense. So again, this is the example we had. Function, but it's worded slightly differently. Function can be used to return the number of y based on x. This is essentially the same before, but it's an example of passive voice. Uh, again, as I said, there's nothing really wrong with this, but it can come across as cold or withdrawn. Um, and okay, in technical documentation, it's maybe not so necessary, but let's just take a more human kind of sentence and then it will maybe become a bit clearer. So for example, holiday approval will be notified in due course. You wanna go on holiday for a week and you get a notification like this from, from your boss. And this is a, an example of a, a passive statement. It feels kind of like no one is really taking responsibility for anything. No one's really telling you who's doing anything. You're left a bit sort of unclear. So a way of putting this in a more active voice would be something like, um, the HR department will notify you about your holiday approval in due course. 
So now you have an actor and a subject. The actor is the HR department, the subject is you, or the subject is your holiday approval. It's kind of multiple subjects. And reframing sentences to kind of have this actor and subject means that things are easier to understand in the long run and people feel like there's an involvement happening. And again, when I first came across this as a good way of doing things, I was skeptical. But over about six months, I suddenly came round to it, and I also found that when I started rephrasing my sentences, it made writing a lot easier too, actually. So give it a go. Next one, keep it short. I already kind of alluded to this. I'm not going to say keep it simple because we are writing technical documentation. It isn't always simple, but that doesn't have to mean that it's verbose, unnecessarily long or rambling or anything like that. Um, and there's certain tricks here. You can reduce repetition. You can reduce down to what is just needed and break documents up into smaller chunks. People have very low attention spans these days. And then there's shorter versions of phrases. So for example, I uh, live and work a lot in Germany and I notice that German English writers tend to say in order to a lot. You can just say to. That's one classic example of just lots of little things you can do to shorten the text. And I have kind of a growing list of these. And I've edited um, German speakers, I've edited Albanian speakers, and I've edited Indian speakers. And every group has their own little things that they do, which is kind of interesting. But that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, and this is actually quite hard. I will say this is strangely one of the harder things. There's a very mis often misquoted quote here from maybe Pascal, Locke, Benjamin Franklin, um, Thoreau, Cicero, or someone else. No one entirely knows who said this, but it's very true. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. It's actually quite hard to write short, concise copy, <laughs> um, surprisingly. Okay, structure. Now, I mentioned earlier that readers can enter your documentation at any place from anywhere. This is already hard. It gets even worse, actually. Many uh, reports have shown from eye tracking, we can do this now on web pages, that online readers, especially of technical content, don't even read what you've written. So I've just told you all these ways of writing great documentation, and now I'm telling you people aren't even reading it. So what's the point? Well, what they're actually doing is scanning. People are looking for titles, subtitles, code, images, just things that stand out. So what you can do is you structure the document to have these breakout points that draws people's attention, and then you make sure that the important points are kind of arranged around those. Um, so I'm just going to show you an example. This is, so this is from a site I used to write for that's a developer site. It's ad-supported. So it's actually a lot more important because we want people to read the content. And this is quite a long, reasonably complicated article. And if, as I scroll down, you'll see that it's quite well structured. There's lots of headings and subheadings and code snippets and images. I don't know how clear it is here, but hopefully they'll even jump out at you. We can see bold. We can see some code. We can see different headings. We can see more code. Um, it's quite well broken up. And if we're scanning through that, we kind of, different things draw our eyes to it, and then we see the text around it. So again, it's about breaking and chunking the content up to make it as readable as possible and as digestible as possible. Yeah. Next is consistency. Uh, I'm quite a big believer in consistency. And what you define as consistency is sort of up to you. And if you're in a bigger company, maybe your marketing department and things like that. Um, how do you say things? How are certain phrases put across? How do you spell or capitalize certain words and things like that? Um, and inconsistent writing can be very distracting. And the reason I mention this, you may think, well, so what? What's, what's documentation got to do with the sales pages? Well, actually, they're often in the same place and they're part of the same website. And even though they're created by different teams or different people, to an outsider's perspective, it's part of the same project or product. So keeping it consistent and making sure that phrases are used the same way is important. But this also comes down to more technical explanations. So for example, when I was working for the database company, it's a scalable database. So we have multiple versions of the database running in a, in a cluster. 
So do we use node? Do we use instance? Do we use server? What do we use? We pick one and then stick to it. Otherwise, people might read node in one place, instance in another, and think, is that the same thing? That's kind of what I mean by consistency in technical documentation. There's often multiple terms, and none are necessarily right or wrong, but pick one and then stick with it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about tooling. Uh, I'm not going to go into massive amounts of detail because there are talks, and I have talks on some of these topics just in particular. But we're equally as obsessive, actually. Technical writing has been around for a reasonable amount of time, and we come from different backgrounds. There's people who work in enterprise communities, there's people who work in open source projects, startups, and we all kind of have different ways of doing things. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the options, and then which one works for you is up to you. So formatting and editing. Um, there's sort of two large camps of uh, ways of writing which then determine the tools you use. Most of these, despite the two very different methodologies, which I'll come to in a minute, are usually plain text. There are some people, I, there's actually quite a lot of people I know who use something like Confluence from Atlassian, so wiki style, but that is still basically a markup language. It's still kind of a plain text language. I have met very few technical writers who use something like Word or even OpenOffice uh, there's reasons for this, which I'll come to in a minute, but often it's about keeping a separation of concerns. So you have the text and the way the text looks separated, so that the text can be repurposed in different ways to look in different ways. So, the first overarching kind of methodology, which is one of the more older ones and comes from kind of an older way of developing software, the time when you had one company that would make maybe an item of desktop software and they produced a manual, they had a help system for the software, maybe they had command line man pages, maybe they had an EPUB, they had different formats. So you needed to repurpose different bits of the same content in different contexts. And this is what's called topic-based writing. So instead of writing a getting started guide, what you actually do is write concepts, you write topics about installing, uh, installing on Linux, installing on Mac, installing on Windows. You write topics about configuring. You write topics about starting. And then you construct the documents based on the topics you want to display. Um, it's, it, it's an interesting one. It's sort of, I, I sometimes struggle to think how you can create a narrative going because you're writing in kind of segmented chunks instead of a narrative. But um, especially if you need to produce content in different outputs, it's quite, um, it's quite useful and it means you don't repeat yourself a lot. You can have one example of installing and that's it. If the steps for installing changes, you don't have to update it in five places. You just update it in one place and it's then updated in those five places. So these are often XML based um, formats uh, and the kind of common ones are things like uh, DocBook and Dita are the, are the formats. And the tools that reflect this are often more complicated. Things like Oxygen, uh, Madcap Flare, um, are kind of some of the tooling. And they tend to be proprietary commercial tools. And they often tend to run on Windows only, which is annoying and also kind of shows you the world they come from. Um, I've wanted to try some of them for a long time, but as you can see, I'm running a Mac. And a lot of the, the tooling for these are Windows only. Um, so it's difficult. It's kind of the world they come from. Then there's kind of the, the new world, or it's to, in my mind, it's the way I've always done it, and probably the way a lot of you do it, which is kind of, we've created our own buzzword called docs as code. <laughs> and this tends to be in the kind of more plain text markup languages. Things like markdown, restructured text, ASCII doc. Just one file marked out in a variety of different ways, um, and it's basically plain text. So. In terms of tooling, it's just a text editor. You can use whatever you like, really. Obviously, some text editors will give you plugins and packages and previews and helpers and all this kind of stuff, but it's basically just plain text. You can use anything. Um, I mean, personally, I'm a fan of something like Markdown, but Markdown is very simple, and that is half of its point. You basically just kind of say, this is a heading, this is a second level heading, this is a list, this is bold, this is italic. But if you want to get into something more complex, 
it starts to, to, to run out of kind of functionality. Whereas things like restructured text allow you to do much more complex embedding of code inside um, other files and things like that. And also in the Python world, I know you have this, the amazing, some of the amazing things you can do with restructured text. Um, a particular documentation renderer and Python is actually test the code directly in the documentation, which only works in Python. So, so well done, because I've tried it in, in other places and you can't do it. So that's a really cool thing about the Python world. Um, management and rendering of documentation. So you've created it in XML, you've created it in Markdown, whatever. How do then people look at it? Um, the docs as code movement tends to just put things into version control. Not particularly uh, outlandish idea. The topic-based authoring, it tends to sit usually in the application and you generate it to the web, to a PDF, to print, to help pages, whatever. Um, and of course, as it's just plain text, as it's in version control, you can start to do all sorts of other weird and wonderful things with it. Um, the tool chain that developers use for continuous integration and testing is opened up to documentation as well. There are some specific uh, management systems. So for example, read the docs is another Python project uh, that kind of was one of the, the first to sort of kickstart the modern wave of uh, technical writing. Um, and that uses Sphinx, the renderer, and it's a free, I think, mostly, as far as I can remember, service for managing documentation and outputting it as HTML and even supports things like separate versioning based on version control tags. So you can keep older documentation for older versions of the program and things like that. And then again, things like Apri, which I've already mentioned, um, and many others. It's actually quite a busy space, especially for API documentation. Often there's companies who also sell API management tools and the documentation functionality is bundled in as part of the price. Um, and then there's static site generators, content management systems, or wonderful tools like Pandoc, if anyone's ever used that, which lets you feed in one kind of type of text and output it in another format. And it can do quite a surprising amount, considering even, even including processing Word files, which is very cool. If you've got Word files and want to turn them into something more useful, it will even do that for you. Um, as I said, this means you can then connect it up to things like continuous integration. I have a whole talk on this slide, which is another way I try to get developers interested in documentation by talking about cool things you can do automatically. So things like um, testing code, uh, testing spell checking, testing grammar, linting the documentation for uh, advice on there's a lot of nice uh, linting tools like the right good linter, which kind of gives you some advice on passive voice amongst other things. Koala, who uh, not by, by pure acquaintance, also Lassie also happens to be here, one of the creators of it, is a kind of all-in-one linting tool. Um, and you can find out more about that if you haven't already from him. Um, and then automation, automatically on merges into master or whatever it happens to be, generating new versions of documentation, things like that. Um, suddenly it becomes, and this is half the reason of keeping it in plain text, is you um, are opened up to this sort of world of treating it like code. Um, if you want to get even crazier, you can do some quite cool things with automatically generating screenshots. If it's a graphical uh, application, um, you can try things like uh, Selenium and the robots framework to, it's typically used for testing, but you can hook it in to your automation process to generate screenshots. And I strongly recommend you look at the documentation for Plone. Again, another Python project. I told you, you guys do it good. Um, and they automatically generate screenshots on every build really, really seamlessly. And um, it works very, very well. Um, and then the advantage, again, of using some of these more open formats is if you're using uh, Vim, Atom, Emacs, writing your own extensions and packages or plugins or whatever it happens to be called to suit something you need to test or you want to check or automate is quite straightforward. <laughs> he says. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of a summary of my talk. If you want to... Um, 
recap some of this. This is a bit.ly link to a blog post I wrote that sort of accompanies this talk, and it's been quite a popular blog post, which was very nice. Um, the write the docs community is kind of the flip side of the read the docs community, and we have meetups. Um, I don't know where the closest one to here is, maybe Vienna, I'm not sure. Um, but if not, we have actually the European conference is usually in Prague, so that's not too far away in September, and there's the American conference in Portland in May, or there's a Slack group where people will be happy to talk to you. We need more Europeans, because usually I wake up in the morning and there's like 50 messages from America that I can't keep up with, and it'd be nice to have more Europeans to talk to. So, <laughs> so join that. And just to kind of summarize, my kind of parting words are, documentation isn't actually just for developers. Um, and this is why I say it's important to keep it clear and concise and well-written. Because whilst it may be developers that mostly use it for kind of an actual active purpose, often people who make business decisions about a project that you're excited about using in the company, for example, will also look at websites, documentation to kind of get an idea of it themselves. And they may not necessarily understand it, but if it's well-written, and looks nice, it's going to encourage them more to also um, be keen and enthusiastic as you. And finally, well-written copy is also SEO. It's getting more pragmatic here, but well-written copy is also found in search engines better as well. So there's a kind of other reasons to think about writing clearer documentation. Uh, that's me. You can find more about me on my website or on Twitter. Uh, I'm kind of a technical writer for hire. I work for a few companies at the moment. I don't have any stickers, but I've got some little cards if you want to stay in touch. Um, and if anyone has any questions, let's get started. documentation and I think after this we have no excuses <laughs> not to write the documentation so let's move to the questions uh, the most liked was uh, the biggest problem with documentation is that it can quickly get outdated uh, how to enforce docs always get updated when something changes yep so the uh, the technical solution or the workflow solution is to make sure, if you go down the kind of docs for, docs as code path, it's probably easier because you can maybe keep the documentation in the same repository as the code or separate but very close. And wh what, why, what method you decide to take is sort of up to you. There's not really a wrong way or a right way. So that you know that um, you can kind of see it in front of you and you know to make changes to it when you make changes to code. The, probably the best answer, unfortunately, though, is more about making sure that you make it part of a process. Um, and you can automate this, or it can just be a checkbox on an issue or on a, on, a, on a sprint that a feature isn't complete until a documentation is written. And you can automate the check for that. Um, so basically, your code is not going out until the documentation is written. Uh, and that includes maybe some of the spell checking and things like that too. You can actually make that break builds if you want to. So the code is not going live until the documentation is written and is good documentation. But a lot of it, unfortunately, no matter how much technical stuff you set up, a lot of it still comes down to making sure that someone sets that process up in the first place. Um, so there's no magic answer, but just make sure either automatically or manually it's kind of enforced. Uh, how much time we should spend creating documentation compared to coding? <laughs> That's a big question because I suppose it depends on the project. Um, hmm. I could just pluck a number out of my head <laughs> and say 10%, but I, I don't know. It really depends. It also depends on the community, the expectations of the community. So, for example, I know the Python community is a lot more into having good documentation. So you're probably more likely to want to do it, whereas other languages are not so into good documentation. So I don't really have a solid answer for that one, unfortunately. I suppose as much as is important to you, um, and depending on your, if you want maybe a more solid answer, 
if it's a commercial product, then documentation means people will understand it and means they will use it. If it's an open source product and you want people to use it, same applies. There's no financial incentive, but there's the user base. So, yeah, I, I, it's not really a sort. There's no, there's no number, <laughs> but, but it's yeah, just as important as it is to you, I suppose. And you personally? Me? Well, I'm a documentation person, so I spend all my time on it. So, so, so um, yeah, and uh, but equally, I suppose, especially with open source projects, um, often at code sprints, uh, beginners are a bit stuck on something to do. So, getting beginners to do documentation is also is a, is a good task just to get people into the community anyway. So that's another answer. And uh, how to conven convince developers to write documentation? Say we don't have dedicated technical writers. Team. Lock the door. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, hmm. I guess I'm preaching to the converted in this room. So, <laughs> so but. One would be, if it's your choice, only involve people, hire people, or bring people into the project who want to. Uh, not everyone wants to, so look for the developers who do want to, I suppose. So then it takes less convincing. Um, I suppose the only, only other motivation I can think of is, well, A, you're just trying to make it as simple as possible, but B, just that encouraging someone that if it's clear and easy to understand, then it means more people will use what they've written. Um, I don't know if all developers are motivated by that. Sometimes people are just happy writing cool code, and if no one uses it, who cares? But, <laughs> but yeah, again, it's a kind of part of the process thing. It's not, there's no definite answer, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, does anybody here from the audience uh, have a question? Okay. You, you could speak to me afterwards. I'm not leaving uh, until tomorrow. We can go and have a beer or something. Uh, there are more questions on oh. Slido, okay. but I think <laughs> yeah, you answered them already. Uh, on which stage of software development cycle you would recommend us writing documentation? From mm. the very beginning? Or in the um, so there's actually different uh, ideas around this. There are some ideas that say you should write the documentation first and then write the code. There's like readme-driven development is one concept. <laughs> so, so there's also, I mean, if you're in an agile environment, you're probably doing it as you write the feature as well. If you're in a kind of more traditional waterfall model, then you might be writing it at the end. Um, I guess stick to the kind of agile principles and do as much as you can as you go, because then you don't forget about it. It stays up to date. Um, a lot of the best practices for code kind of apply, really. Okay, and the last question is, do you think that bigger open source projects should pub publish documentation in different languages? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am exceptionally lucky that I get to travel around Europe um, helping people in my own native language, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky that English is, a, is a, such a sort of universal language, but it would be great if things were available in other languages, and I think I think it, it happens, especially in bigger projects. Again, it's a really good task to get people to start with. You don't even have to understand the, the, the project to be able to translate some of the documentation sometimes. So it can be a really good way to get people started. But yes, and actually I didn't even cover that. There's a lot of this tooling has functionality built in for translations and things like that too. Um, but yeah, definitely. So thank you very much again. Thanks.